Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be joining you. I'm in London, in England. Um, my name's Sarita Puri, and I am a chef um, and teacher at Made in Hackney. You can kind of see our logo here. Um, we were the UK's first plant-based community cookery school. Um, and we're going to be going through for the next uh, sort of 55 minutes or so a little bit about batch cooking and um, sort of scaling up cooking, cooking for your community or um, other people. And I also just want to tell you about the work that we do and the support that we can offer all around the globe. So before I crack on with the cooking, let me just um, bring up a couple of slides. Um, and then if there's any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if it's things about what I'm doing during the session, I'll try and answer them as I see them. But anything else um, we can come to at the end, just like you did in that last session. Um, and you may have detected a Scottish accent from me. So it was really nice to hear in the end of that session about um, all the work and the sort of comparisons of work in Edinburgh. That is my hometown. Um, so, yeah, it would be great to see Edinburgh and lots of other places go fully vegan. Um, so I'm just going to quickly tell you about our work at Maiden Hackney in London, if you're not aware of us. So as I mentioned, we're the UK's first uh, fully vegan um, community cookery school. We've been going for, uh, this will be our 12th year now. We started in uh, 2012 um, and we are based in East London and we operate a fully plant-based kitchen that is there for, you know, educating people about the power of plants, about health, about their own well-being, about the environmental impact, as you've all been, been talking about more recently, um, but also really as a place of bringing people together, social cohesion, mental well-being, and all those other things that being together around food can do. We are in um, one of the most culturally diverse parts of London, so we always make sure that our food sort of reflects the communities that either our teachers come from or the people in our class. And um, we try not to sort of, you know, uh, obstruct any any sort of different like vegetables or cuisines coming in. So whilst we largely promote seasonal um, organic and local food, we also appreciate that there is a role for um, food from other countries to meet the needs of those uh, people that we sort of that we're supporting. And we also do a lot of work promoting things like UK grown grains and pulses and a lot of the sort of companies and uh, suppliers that are doing all this great work that can then mean that things like Callaloo can be um, grown in the UK and millet and other uh, great ingredients. Um, so if there's any questions about that at the end, I can come on to that. And I just wanted to tell you about this program um, that Alison, who is part of Climate Healers, has been part of and is still a part of. And it's called Global Plant Kitchens. So this is a free program um, which provides information, support, training materials, um, recipes, modules, videos. If you want to start your own plant based community cookery school. Now, that might seem like a really big thing to do, but it doesn't need to be a big building with multiple classrooms and so on. You can start small. So if you have a space in a community hall or you want to do some online classes, there's lots of different ways you can start. And there's lots of different information about how we've got to where we are um, and also how we're supporting other projects around the world. So um, the website is globalplantkitchens.org. But if you've got any questions about how that works and the support we might be able to give you, um, we'll come on to that in a little bit. OK, so. The reason we were asked to um, uh, take part today is because Maiden Hackney does these two, two things that I've told you about, the cookery school and global plant kitchens, but we also have a community meal service and we scale up um, hundreds of meals a week. Um, for about 18 months during the pandemic, I was the head chef of that programme and at our peak we were doing about 1,200 meals so working in um, a range of settings, we sort of had to move around a lot wherever there was an empty kitchen space in London. Um, and with our team of chefs and volunteers and cyclists, we had quite a logistical operation to get that done. So batch cooking might seem like simple if it's if you're if you're cooking a lot, but if you're wanting to cook for say 
10, 20, 50, 100 people, that's when it starts to get a little bit complicated because you have to start thinking of things in different ways. So I am in my home kitchen right now and I'm not going to cook 100 portions because I don't have that big a freezer. Um, so I'll be showing you a sort of family size batch whilst talking through some of the tips and tricks that you might want to incorporate into um, your work. And if you have questions, like I say, um, we will come to them. Now, the recipe I can either drop in the chat or um, I did share it with the organisers so that can get shared too. Um, but I'll be, be cooking a very simple unity stew, which is a climate healer's concept of a wholly nutritious, whole food plant-based um, dish that is really accommodating to people from all backgrounds, all religions, and hopefully all dietary requirements. Um, so it's using essentially pulses, vegetables, and spices, keeping it super simple. We're not using any oil. Um, I'm not using any onion or garlic because some people might not eat onion and garlic, either for religious reasons or for other dietary reasons. And the only allergen out of the 14 um, commonly known allergens in the U in Europe anyway, I don't know if they're slightly different in the US, um, is celery. And celery can, of course, be admitted if you um, don't eat celery or if you want this to be a fully, fully, fully inclusive meal. Um, and we're going to be serving it with your choice of a grain. So, um, like I say, I can send that round um, and or share it in the chat at the end. I've got it as a PDF. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to come off the PowerPoint setting um, whilst I'm doing this. So if you want to take a photo or a screen grab, do that just now. Um, and most of the ingredients can be swapped out for other things. And I'll talk all that through anyway. And then um, here is the method. If anyone wants to take a picture or screen grab of that now, like I say, I'll be coming off of the PowerPoint just now. Um, Cool. OK, let's get going. So I have two cameras. Um, if the organiser could pin the one that says my name, Srita Puri, that is, and it looks like a, you can see a chopping board. If you can pick, brilliant. So I'll, um, what I'll do is I'll slightly move that camera as well so you can see both things. It usually works pretty good. Uh, so like I mentioned, this you can do with any form of vegetables, any any um, pulses, anything that you sort of prefer. Move that slightly. Yeah, there we go. Um, now, I have gone for uh, largely things that are in season in the UK at the moment. So I've got carrot and celery, like mentioned on the um, on the recipe. I've also in here got some turnip, um, which is like Swede. Um, which is because that's really root vegetables are really like what we can get at the moment. Um, and then I've got a sweet potato, which I do not think is British, um, but root vegetables are all sort of in at the moment. And then um, I'm actually using some tomatoes, but I would normally use chopped tomatoes at this time of year. Um, but you can use chopped or fresh depending on where you are. And then I've got some parsley uh, for later. And my beans are a mix of Pinto beans and burlotti beans. Now, I'm just going to uh, peel this sweet potato whilst I sort of talk, talk through some of the um, things about vegetables. So when you're batch cooking, the most important things to think about are um, the types of food that you're, the people that you're feeding might want. And that might seem straight, straightforward. But what we find at um, Made in Hackney is we've got such a diverse group of people that we serve. We've got children, we've got elders, we've got people with um, type 2 diabetes. So we really need to try and have a balanced meal that suits everybody's health, but also everybody's um, palate. And what we find is that some people, you know, they don't like the word vegan or even plant-based. So we don't actually really use those words when we're talking about our food. We'll We'll talk about it being a, you know, a delicious, hearty, rich stew um, or a winter lasagna or something like that. Um, it's not to say we never say the word vegan, but for us, it's just about making sure that we're 
sort of being as accessible to as many people as possible. So the reason I sort of also say that when I'm peeling um, the sweet potato is that we sometimes use a lot of butternut squash. Um, and that's a really, really good one for some of the Caribbean dishes we do. But we will always peel the squash in that class, in that um, class or for the meal service, because we've got a lot of elders who can't quite chew the skin. Whereas if we're cooking, you know, for ourselves, we would keep the skin on probably. Um, and what I'm going to do with these skins later on is I'm going to turn these into like a homemade stock. So nothing goes to waste. Um, and I just boil up all my vegetable skins with a bit of salt and pepper and um, maybe some cloves, bay leaf and some spices and then use that. So I did some stock already this morning, not realising that I might have these today. So um, the next thing to think about with your vegetables when you're preparing for a large group is thinking about what vegetables like this sweet potato um, might cook down quickly and what might lose their weight and their colour um, and their weight and their, yeah, that's it, their weight. <laughs> um, because this sweet potato won't lose much weight. So in a portion, it'll still be quite shapely. And um, whereas if I was to cook the equivalent amount of mushrooms or even tomatoes or um, bell peppers, they might cook down quite a lot, meaning that the final portion is not going to be the same. So we always plan our meals to be a mixture of sort of, you know, root vegetables, hard food, um, as well as the softer, softer veg. So I think in the recipe, I will have said, um, have about, for this, for this portion, have about a kilo of, of um, vegetables, but make sure that when you're swapping, like when you're swapping out, it's like for like. So if I'm taking a carrot out, I'm not going to swap it for um, courgette, for example, because courgette is a very water heavy um, dish um, uh, ingredient and it will change the profile of the dish. So whilst I'm chopping, I'm just going to bring my stock to the boil. So this is just um, regular stock. You can either use your homemade stock or you can use like a stock cube. And I've added some herbs in here as well. And I'm just going to bring that to the boil just now. Like I mentioned, we are not using oil in this. I'm not using onions. So if I was doing, say, a, a stew or a curry that I was using those, then I would start off by frying onions. But this keeps it nice and um, nice and simple. Okay. Um, the other thing in terms of vegetables, when we're doing batch cooking, we will always consider uh, using frozen veg as well. You know, peas in the UK are such a good, affordable frozen vegetable. They're high in protein and um, they're affordable. If you've got freezer space or a freezer, you can use them. Um, but it also means that in terms of speed of cooking, it makes things quite quicker. And then the second thing to think about in terms of speed of cooking is if you've got any gadgets or equipment that can help save time, it's worth investing in them. So when we were cooking, you know, 600 portions a day, we're not doing it all by hand like this. The sweet potato, we would probably do like by hand if we're cubing it, but we would use um, like, uh, you can maybe just see in the back of here, I've got like a food processor. Um, we would use ones like that, you know, just domestic size ones. You don't need commercial, um, even in a community project. And we would get all the carrots through that, the cabbage through that, things that can shred or grate. And that would make our days much, much quicker. And it means if you're working with volunteers that don't have as much food experience, then it's a little bit safer and, and just easier. So I, mean, I saw someone saying about the um, the stock being nice and sweet with the sweet potato skin. It really would be. Adds a really nice uh, depth of flavour. And what I would say with stocks is to think about the balance of the ingredients you're putting in it. Because if you have too much onion, for example, it'll end up being quite bitter. 
and then sleeps. Is there a distinction? Uh, oh yeah, someone's just said there about um, are some veggies too bitter? Yes, so things like kale and too much onion, think anything that's got too much of a bitter bitter taste, um, then you wouldn't want to put in. I used a bit of stocks from Spring Greens earlier and it was fine because I wasn't using too much in my stock. So it really is sort of just kind of depends. Okay, and then I'm just gonna chuck I'm just seeing about the camera just now. So I'm just whilst um, I'm chopping mother veg, I'm just going to put those sweet potatoes straight into this stock, actually, whilst they're ready. In fact, all the stuff that I've already. So I'll show you in, inside the pan in a minute once I've moved the uh, board out of the way. Now the celery, um, celery is just a really good... Um, sort of core flavour um, and I you know if I'm cooking for a large group like batch cooking for a meal I would normally cut the celery quite small like much smaller than I'm doing right now just because um, sometimes people don't think they like celery but they like the flavour so I would cut it like pretty small if possible so diced much smaller than um, the other veg because you kind of want the celery to go super super soft as well and then finally with the carrot. Again, we could do this in a um, in a like food processor. I'm just gonna get that all in here. Now for this type of stew, I would always keep the vegetables nice and chunky. Um but if you're, again, if you're cooking, say, for children, quite often the children, when we're doing children's classes, we'll cook down the vegetables much smaller. We're not totally trying to hide them because they're cooking in, in the classes with us. But sometimes it's that thing of persuasion of you might be a bit less familiar with it. So you need to sort of have it um, in a different way. And so often we find with our classes, people say, oh, I never liked carrots until I had this one. Or, oh, I, I would have never eaten Thai food until I tried this homemade Thai curry. So it's all about being accessible, being open and being welcoming. That's the one thing I think that really sets Mead and Hackney um, sort of up there. You know, people know that we have a really friendly, welcoming approach and that we don't, you know, we don't tell people that, you know, they have to go vegan or that you know, certain, you know, we don't sort of tell people what we think is right or wrong, even if it's our own opinions. Um, it's all about being accessible and open to people. So I'm just gonna move this further here. There we go. So in here, what I've got is I've got my stock. I'm just gonna cut that one a bit smaller. And I've got my vegetables. So all I'm doing there is just making sure that most vegetables are the same size. And that's super, super important when you're doing um, big, big portions. So if we were cooking um, in our big meal service, what we would do is, we, you know, we'd have pans two or three times the size of this. So a bit back. Um, two or three times the size of this. And we would be, um, if you're putting that much in, if, if you've got, large chunks and small chunks the small chunks are going to cook quicker and then the other thing that we will often do when we're cooking this amount of food again in this big pot if you think you're using even a pot like this this is about you know half of half a foot tall but if you've got anything bigger it's going to be so warm at the bottom less hot at the top so quite often what we will do is we will batch cook a sauce and then we'll cook off our vegetables separately. And um, if you have a if you've got an oven, that's a perfect way to just fill trays of vegetables, um, in the oven. And it means that when all your vegetables are cooking at different speeds and different or well, different speeds, you can have one temperature on your oven, and you can have a tray of, um, eggplant, a tray of sweet potato, a tray of, uh, mushrooms, and so on. And then you can take them out as they're ready and then add them to the sauce at the end. So that's a sort of easier way to get around how to cook a consistent meal 
at a large, large level, because that's sort of quite often um, where the trouble is. So in this pot at the back, I've got the um, the stock, the uh, sweet potato, the carrot and the celery. Now these are all, I'm just gonna add a little bit more hot water to the and just to cover it. There we go. I don't want too much water in here because I don't want it to be a soup, but I do, I am gonna be adding more ingredients. So I do want some liquid there and some of the water will evaporate. Um, so the reason that I'm cooking these ingredients together is because they're all ingredients that take a little bit longer as well. The carrot will take the longest, but I've cut that the smallest. And then the sweet potato takes a little bit less time. And then the celery is sort of somewhere in the middle, but I don't mind if that goes like super, super soft um, and stringy and almost falls apart. Um, um, and then what I'm gonna do now is prepare the other bits for the, the next step. As I mentioned, the sort of the other main component of this is uh, beans. So here I have I've used tinned beans, but in if I was doing a scaling up dish, um, so these are just household small in the UK four hundred gram tins, but if I was doing a big scaling up, um, we would use the large large tins or. Um, use dried beans because they're much more economical. If you've got a big pan, you can soak them overnight and then get to them the next day. Some sometimes, if you don't have your own venue, though, that can be a challenge. And we definitely faced that challenge before when we've moved around kitchens because we'd only be in on the day of cooking. So unless we could plan the day before and soak our beans and then bring our beans to the boil, that's another hob. It's more space. It's more time. So whilst um, that might sort of be the, the slightly better thing to do generally, um, sometimes things like canned beans um, are just easier, especially when you're needing to cook in a hurry. And knowing that if you're then trying to teach people in the community, and a lot of people do not cook anything, you know, showing them how to chop a potato is like new to them. So again, you have to take out all of your own knowledge and your preconceptions and just think what are people um, most likely to do and how can I encourage them to eat plants um, so the other important thing about having these is obviously these are well not obviously take away my preconceptions these are a source of protein and that is always the question that all vegans always get asked all the time where do you get your protein from um, and I'm sure 99% if not 100% of the people here know the answer to that. Um, so it's just about informing um, and educating other people within your community and your networks about protein sources um, and the range of them and how to cook them and any of the sort of uh, myths or misconceptions that people have about them. Um, on the uh, um, recipe sheet, or on, uh, I think I've said allocate for about 80 grams of portion per person. That's how we figure out how much food to put in when we're scaling up. So if I'm cooking for 100 people, I'll need eight kilos um, of um, drained beans if they're cooked. And then that way, that really helps with your planning. Same with your vegetables. I would go for at least, I'd try and go for 200 grams of vegetables per, per person. Now that kind of depends on if it's a hard veg, a softer veg, something that cooks down loads like spinach. Um, but as you get used to scaling up and figuring out how many, not only portions per person for their nutritional um, input, but also in terms of getting a balance of number of plants and so on. So those are the kind of key things to think about. Uh, Cool. Okay, so I'm just whilst this is bubbling and bubbling, I'm just gonna move the camera back here and bring the the chopping board back. I have a little sip of my herbal tea as well. So, so tomato. We're going to put some tomato in, and there's, like I said, I'm using a, a raw one here, but tinned tomato is the way to go when you're scaling up, um, especially if you live in a country 
like I do, that doesn't have um, fresh tomatoes much of the year. Um, British tomatoes only taste nice in like the height of the summer. Um, so sadly, this is not a British tomato and it doesn't, you know, I already know that it's going to be not the most delicious one that I've ever had. However, um, I got them in a veg box the other day. Um, so there's a couple of reasons that I'm putting tomato in. One is for colour. Um, one is obviously for flavour. And the other thing is for uh, vitamin C. So tomatoes are a really good source of vitamin C. And so that in itself is a great reason. Um, but also one of my ingredients is gonna be spinach or any greens um, and dark leafy greens, great source of iron. Um, however, they need the vitamin C to break down that iron. So it's just little things like that that is that you can incorporate into a teaching or just when you're doing a community meal or even just when you're um, serving food to someone else that you know. Sort of little nuggets of information that show how you can have a healthy and um, plant-based diet because we all know how much misinformation there has been out there recently of you know vegan junk food and you know vegan food is just as bad for the planet etc cetera, etc cetera. but if you can sort of educate people on the healthy whole plants um is uh someone's asking how many sweet potatoes is 200 grams oh um so a, a medium carrot is about 70 to 80 grams and um, so about three medium carrots would be 200 grams and a sweet potato I used a really big one um so the one I used was probably about 500 grams to be honest um and also I'm speaking in grams I don't know if you're speaking grams I realized this that a lot of people like cook in cups and ounces and so on um but when we cook, um, oh, let me just get rid of this first. Um, the other thing that I should say is when we do our cooking classes is we tend to write things out in tablespoons and teaspoons um, where possible. So, for example, um, a tablespoon of soy sauce instead of 15 mils of soy sauce, because people are more likely to have tablespoons and teaspoons however if you're then doing a cookbook or a formal recipe then it's a different way so we do sort of have to adjust for that so I'm just going to check my veggies I've I've been blasting the heat on this a little a little bit just to um get it to the right place at the right time but it's doing very well okay so um the other thing that um, I'm going to prep just now whilst I have the time is I'm going to use some parsley um, and I've got another thing to never ever ever throw away is your herb stalks so parsley is quite a good one because it's not too chewy something like mint mint is probably the only um, herb stock that I do get rid of but most of your herb stocks you can either just cut down really fine and use it as varnish or anything else and um, However, I'll just see what someone said. Um, however, I'm also just going to put this into there. So the stalks will just add a really nice bit of flavour, especially if you cut them down really, really finely. And then the leaves, just shredding them to put through at the end. And the other, you know, a lot of people think herbs are just there for a bit of flavour. They are, but herbs is where we get so many powerful properties from. So things like... Um, uh, parsley and coriander they've got the, the same properties or similar properties to things like kale spring greens and spinach so they count when we're talking about get your greens and sounds obvious but a lot of people kind of think oh that's not in my portion of veg etc all right okay so oh, and then i'm just gonna chop this for garnish uh, and then I think the last thing I'm going to do is chop my lemon, uh, squeeze my lemon and then get my grains going. So it means I can also get rid of this board. Okay. So. 
So I'm just going to show you, in fact, you can see it from there. Okay. Uh, so the stew is bubbling. Um, the other thing that I should have mentioned was when you're choosing your selection of vegetables is think about what might release water and what doesn't. All vegetables have got high water content, some more so than others. Um, mushrooms release quite a lot of liquid. Um, courgettes, aubergines, the sort of softer vegetables. Most of the veg I've put in here doesn't release as much. Um, so they've kind of held their own, which is partly why they don't lose the weight overall. Um, but it's then also not meaning that too much more liquid is developing in there. Um, and then if you ever do have too much liquid, you can leave the lid off um, for a while. So I'm just going to cover that up. Okay. Um, so the recipe, this recipe we would do with whatever um, grain that you want and what your choice is. Um, for ease and quickness, I'm just going with couscous, which is um, a really simple grain. Um, whereas what I would always recommend is maybe um, if, if you've got something like quinoa or millet or pear barley or something, um, they're really, really lovely as well. But couscous is a really good one because it's affordable um, and it's easy to scale up. So any day we've had couscous on the menu in the meal service, it's a day that the chefs are like, phew. Whereas if you're trying to do pasta and potatoes and rice all in one day, um, the kitchen can get a little bit of chaos, um, especially at 200 portions. So I'll just move this back to here. Um, so if you are not familiar with couscous, uh, I'm going to show you some on a spoon. So it's just um, a semolina grain so it's it's not um it's not gluten free so again if you're planning your menu say you're wanting to do two different dishes um we would never have couscous and pasta as our like grain or our carb we would always make sure at least one is um uh, gluten gluten free and going back to the eat well plate that was mentioned in the last session and we have the the maiden hackney one on our website um, and we've also done a sort of culturally diverse one as well, so that we're not excluding any of our community members, because um, some people that we work with were maybe not as familiar. Maybe they don't eat pasta um, or maybe they have vegetables like yam and cassava, which is the like the sort of uh, stodgy sort of um, carb in their diet. So we've we've got a version that sort of has a bit more culturally diverse ones, too. Um. Really good question, Susan. I was going to mention um, pressure cookers. Yes. So I have one behind me uh, like that I use personally. Um, and I would essentially just, everything I've done just now, I would just chuck it all in in the morning or at night and then leave it for like eight hours. Um, they're also really good in a community setting because you could do your beans on them. Like I said before, beans take quite a long time Um you've got to wash them you've got to soak them and then you've got to boil them if you use a pressure cooker then you can kind of speed up that cooking process and um, so yeah with the couscous um you essentially just cover it with water and then i'm gonna add some of this parsley and a little bit of salt and pepper and um, a little bit of oil is some like olive oil sometimes quite nice in um Couscous, um, oops, uh, you can have couscous absolutely plain, but I do sort of like to just add a little bit of flavor to it as well. I'm gonna just add a tiny bit of paprika too. Okay, so where are we? So I'm just gonna give that a stir. Um, and then with your couscous as well, what we quite often do with our grains at the meal service is um, we'll add vegetables to them. So, for example, we will add um, peas and carrots to our rice. We'll add, um, you know, maybe some tomatoes or olives or something into this. Again, it's getting like vegetables in by stealth sometimes. Someone might not eat as much of the main, but they might eat the rice or the couscous, for example. I'm just going to put that to one side. Um, and then I'm going to bring us back over to the main pan. Um, if you do beans in a... Pr I, yeah, someone's asking if you do beans in a pr pressure cooker, do you still soak them first? Um, 
I do. I think you can get away with um, just giving them a good wash and doing the whole bean in the pressure cooker. Um, but I do still tend to just because if I'm soaking beans, I'm soaking beans, which maybe doesn't make sense. OK, so in here, there is a lot of steam, but you can hopefully see uh, this sweet potato is super soft, as is the carrots. So that's all good. So all I'm going to do now is add in um, the rest of my ingredients. I'm going to add in the tomato. The tomato doesn't need as long. I'm going to add in the beans. I'm going to add juice of half a lemon, which I said I was going to juice and then forgot, so I'll just do it straight into the pan. And that's that's also just um adds vitamin C, um, and cut, like cuts a bit through the flavor too. And you can either add the lemon juice at this stage, or you can add it right at the end. Um, it doesn't really make a huge difference. And I'm also going to add in my flavors now. So we have um one thing we always say in our classes is. For our community classes anyway, we try and keep the number of like herbs and spices used per dish to quite a small number because a lot of people that um, join our program might not have much money or they might not cook that often. So if we tell them to buy coriander, cumin, chili, ginger, nutmeg, you know, if we tell them everything, then they might not use it again. And also it's quite a lot of money if you're spending, say, one to two pounds on a small thing of spice because you can't afford to buy like a big packet and um, then it's then it's not really necessarily that economical for you okay so i'm gonna use some paprika some nutmeg and some ginger and a bit of uh, salt and pepper and you could use fresh ginger here too as well but um just for sort of again accessibility um i've used round Checking on the questions. Uh, and then when teaching kids, you can do really nice fun games with spices. You can talk about, you know, where they come from. You can talk about what they look like. Like nutmeg is a really interesting one. Um, you know, you can, it's a really good way to start talking about um, uh, the like food trade. So you can talk about the history of say like, the, the spice roots and so on and then talk about how that's changed and you know the colonial world and the influence that's had um on our cooking without being you know too over the top and political to a bunch of 10 year olds um when did i start my cooking journey lovely question Paige. um i probably started as a child because my dad um was a chef my dad was an uh he came over from india in his 20s um, and sort of did the typical thing of just working in hospitality, finding whatever jobs he could. Um, and he moved from London to then Scotland, which is where I was born. Um, and yeah, worked in hotels, restaurants, had his own kitchens. And then I started sort of cooking for a, a career, maybe in the last like, eight to 10 years, um, like running my own um, events and supper clubs, um, as well as teaching for Maiden Hackney. So I got involved in Maiden Hackney um, because I saw our founder, Sarah, who if you haven't, if you're not familiar with Maiden Hackney, um, there is a TED talk by Sarah, Sarah Bentley, and it's called uh, Why the World Needs Community Kitchens and the sort of power of food and bringing people together. So I saw her speak at an event and I was like, well, this is what I want to do. I really want to do food stuff, but I want to be doing the education and the community side. So I got in touch with her maybe seven or eight years ago, and that's kind of how I'm now part of the team. Um, and sort of on and off through that, because um, I'm, I'm sort of self-employed through that. Um, I've done lots of other food projects and restaurant things and, and so on. So it's it's kind of like deep inside me um, and I love doing it. So, yeah, so it's great to be here with you guys all today. Um, and my vegan journey. So I was, um, I'm just going to put this in. Um, the last thing that I forgot to put in was um, a, a tiny dash of hing or asa potato. This is just a, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, this is 
I'm really bad at doing things backwards. It says asafoetida. So it's um it's a little like yellow um powder. It's used a lot in Indian cooking or South Asian cooking. Um and it's it's basically um it it takes like it gives a bit of onion garlic taste, so it's really good for anyone that's following, say, an Ayurvedic de- diet or is um, of the Jain faith. Um, but it also helps to take away like the bloating and the gassiness that a lot of people get from beans if they're not familiar with eating beans. Um, so, yeah, oh, I think someone's put in the YouTube, in the chat, a YouTube video. Um, yeah, my vegan journey. So I... I became vegetarian at about the age of eight because I my favorite animals were pigs and then when I put together that pigs were bacon I was like really upset my dad being a chef he was also a single parent um he then had to start cooking like two meals um but he did it because he would always kind of do what his children wanted um and then I was vegetarian for like most of my life and then I probably knew that my values which were very like animal based ethical values I probably knew that that would have should have meant I should be vegan when I was a child I didn't know what vegan was when I was in my 20s the only vegans I knew were really unhealthy like they ate bananas and potatoes and that was it and I was like "Mm." (laughs) and then um essentially I kind of became vegan by accident about eight or ten maybe nine or ten years ago um I basically decided to stop eating cheese after being in and in Brazil. I was eating like just basically a cheese and bread diet. So I was like, I'll stop eating cheese for a bit. Um, I never really liked eggs. I couldn't stomach milk. So I didn't actually eat that much dairy. Um, and so then whilst I stopped eating cheese, I then was like, oh, well, that was easy. I had the typical, um, oh, I could never give up cheese chat. So I... Um, I then um, put, I then basically put that into practice and was like, well, if I can take out cheese, let's just take out everything else that is the non-vegan parts of my vegetarian diet. So I did that. It was super simple. Um, And at the same time, I went back to, um, uh, I sort of went back to education. I'd already read books like Eating Animals and by Jonathan Safar Foe. But then I, you know, there was a lot of the documentaries out and so much stuff on the internet. Um, Twitter was, I knew loads of vegans on Twitter. Um, and yeah, that just kind of was it. And then I just thought, well, gosh, why haven't I done this before? And like so many people do. Um, and that's kind of it. And then I was working in a um in a charity-based job, um, which was great, doing like like education stuff, but um Basically, I then took voluntary redundancy and um, was like, well, I now need to do my life kind of needs to be to do with like veganism. So that's kind of what I've been doing for the past like eight years is cooking things or writing projects or consultancy projects and um, lots and lots of different things. Uh, so the final thing I'm going to put in here is the spinach. So the the tomatoes, if you're using tin tomatoes, um they do need time to cook down and sort of take a little bit of like bitterness away and then the the uh, raw tomatoes it'll just be the sort of skin will be kind of coming off and they'll be nice and loose and then i'm just gonna put in uh quite a lot of spinach and um, i'm using baby spinach so it doesn't um it will just uh what's the word wilt down um but if you're using oh that one's still muddy if you're using um like large large leaf spinach or spring greens or kale uh you can just chop that up first okay i'm just going to put that on the top there and put the lid on it that will help it wilt down and the last thing i wanted to show you was the little greens Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to just add in a bit of my uh, parsley as well now. Show you the grains and I'll show you a plate as well. Let's move these things. And let me just see. No more questions at the moment. And then just before I 
Uh, this this is good. Um, I'm just going to go back to the presentation I had because there was a few tips and I don't know if I've incorporated them all um, in what I've been saying. Let me just share my screen again. And yeah, basically now is a really good time if you've got um, questions about anything um, that we have covered in this session. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, let me see if I've covered these. Um, health and safety. This is like really, really important. And it obviously varies depending on what country you're in. In the UK it's and the rest of Europe, it is pretty strict. And there's um legislation, there's food safety things that you can't just cook from like your own home. Like if I'm cooking this to for it to go somewhere, I have to have um public liability insurance, for example. But if you're a kitchen where you're doing your teaching, you also need to have be registered as a food business and so on. So there's a lot of like food safety and all of these things that you need to take into consideration. Um, and then part of that, I've kind of mentioned a couple of times, is things like um, allergens, um, just sort of knowing what people want. So there's the 14 major allergens, but a lot of people might have like different dietary requirements. So on our meal service, we have um, some people that can't eat tomatoes, which is actually quite common, um, especially if people are following like sort of certain diets, um, or there might be people that can't eat spicy food um, or there might be people that, that literally need like a bland or a really soft diet for their sort of digestive needs so being aware of that is really really important um being ready with equipment space and storage might sound simple but actually if you're buying in bulk and we get a lot of stuff donated as well so we might get a 20 kilo bag of potatoes and we might get five of them a week because food surplus charities vary so much here what they give you week on week and you can't um you can't always order for example so making sure you know where you're going to put it or if you can pass it on to someone else and um, if you can't use it and making things, sure things are sort of used as and when they need to be in terms of what what's coming first or what might go off first um, making adaptable dishes. What I mean by that is, um, for example, I talked about making um, potentially making a tomato base, like a tomato sauce, and then adding all your vegetables and pulses into it. Um, we might use a make a really simple tomato sauce with onion, garlic, some basic herbs, and tomato, and then we can turn that into a pasta dish one day. We could turn it into a curry with added spices another day. We could use it. Um, in a stew like this for example so then you've sort of done the work once and you can use it in lots of different ways and um, when we're batch cooking we do do a lot of one pot meals like this and um, just because they're simpler sometimes we'll go a bit fancy and we might have a salad on the side or something and um, but that means it's really really straightforward and um, i'm just going to give this a stir whilst i do the last one um, and then uh, eat the rainbow so hopefully you've sort of been aware that um you know in here we've got red oranges greens browns and um, see those spinach is really uh really really cooked down there and um, you know making sure you're getting as many colors and as many plants in in as possible you know for your gut health 30 plants a week is sort of what's recommended. So how set yourself a challenge. How many plants can you get into one meal? So you see that spinach has gone nice and down. Um, uh, I've talked about the, the balance of vegetables before. Um, prep full meals or components. That's kind of what I meant as well about the tomato sauce or doing a tray of peppers, a tray of eggplant. Um, if you're scaling up, it's quite nice to do other things, tips like things in advance. So we might make a spice blend where we buy lots of, um, we get lots of big bags of spices, buy in bulk, and then we could make, say, a curry rub, a chipotle, um, a chipotle powder, you know, things like that. Um, and then the other things, especially if you're cooking on the scale, uh, things like garlic and ginger take a long time to prep. So we will tend to buy our garlic um peeled already because that's a privilege that we can do um or you know you can buy lots and lots of clothes um and then we'll just blitz down a big container blitz down a whole load and make a container and put some oil on the top of that and it will um keep it nice and sealed you can obviously buy ginger and garlic paste they do tend to have a lot of 
nonsense in them to keep them going. Um, but again, from a budgetary point of view, sometimes you might decide to make that um, decision. Um, and then cooking veg that doesn't cook down too much. So you can see hopefully in here, my veg, my spinach has cooked down loads. So that's gone from 400 grams to like barely any. Um, so it's really, really important to have those bigger ones as well. Okay, I'm just going to take my sharing off. We've got a few minutes left. Um, are there any more questions? Uh, children cutting with knives. So we have, um, like, you can get kid-safe knives here in the UK anyway, but they're kind of for, like, really young children. Um, we kind of go off, off of trust and supervision. So we will make sure that we've got enough, like, adults per group and we'll sort of make sure that we're sort of with the children as we're um as they're doing the cutting now obviously if someone the child is not used to it then they, maybe their hand will slip or something I've done so many children's classes at Maiden Hackney and haven't had um, an accident with children um you know we're always also like oh will the children like hurt each other with knives like they actually don't well they haven't you know we're in like East London like they don't threaten it <laughs> so I think again it's that that thing of like trust with them but supervision and having enough like adults to children ratio um and being aware of what you're asking them to cut so something like a tomato is quite a challenge even for some adults to cut a carrot you know making sure so you've got your carrot which is circular make sure it's cut in half maybe you do that and then put the flat side down on the table now you should be doing that with adults too but with children, it's more important because like hands and like slippiness as well. Um, is this something we can start in the US? Yes. So um, how many classes are taught? Um, we, oh, that's a really good question. If you go on our website, maidenhackney.org, you can basically, we tend to have at least two, if not three, six week courses a week. Um. So, for example, it could be West African cooking or it could be cooking on a budget. So it was maybe tea theme or um, cuisine. Um, just see this, this couscous is nice and fluffy now. Um, and um, we also have like one-off community classes like in the evenings and we do master classes which are paid for, which then helps us run our services. Um, and someone asked about uh, how many people are you serving per week? Um, the height of what we will serve per week is 200 um, and it's slightly lower at the moment because we've slightly changed our model and then someone oh Alison thank you has put in um, Maiden Hackney's website um, and uh, yes you can start um, I'll just put in global plant in fact Alison could you put in globalplantkitchens.org um, and that is um, where all of the information and support for how to start your own kitchen um, is Um. And that's the project that Alison is involved in. So, and then I've just played up like this. We also do them in like nice boxes. Um, I'd probably give a bit more veg. Think about your eat well plate um, and how much veg should be on your plate and how much um, protein and so on. So yeah, um, that is um, us. Um, bang on time, hopefully. Um, and yes, it's been such a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna stick about in the background for a bit. Um, but yeah, thank you all for all your questions um, and for everything else. I've really, really enjoyed today um, and it's really great to see such an amazing global community um, and hopefully together we can like really, really uh, change some things through ethics and, you know, caring about everybody on this planet. Thank you, Sarita. You didn't take a bite. Oh, <laughs> I know. I need to taste that actually, don't I? See if it's any good. This is this is the thing when you cook at home. Mmm, it's lovely. Nice and soft vegetables and a juicy, juicy flavor. <laughs> Thank you, Sarita.